start with introducing yourself. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, whenever you fire away. Okay. okay so, I'm Jade Detero. I live in Kelowna. I've moved here in June, and I'm a first year family medicine resident. So, I completed my medical schooling in June and came out here in this program's two years. So. And where did you attend medical school? I was in Thunder Bay at oh. the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. I'm actually from Northern Ontario. I'm oh. from a small town called Fort Francis. So. It was nice to be close to home. Yeah, excellent. And Jade, how old were you when you thought about becoming a doctor? <laughs> I love this question. I was three. You kidding? Yeah, I, I don't know how or why the joke in our family is that my parents uh, used to whisper over my crib and kind of send me subliminal messages in my sleep, but I just had a very basic rudimentary understanding as a child that doctors help people. I didn't realize there was anybody else in the world who did and that's what I wanted to do and that was just my set path and I really never changed my mind. Wow, that's amazing. So, so can I ask now, when you're going through school, there's a lot of kids out playing and having a good time and mm -hmm. wasting away, <laughs> but if you're going to be a doctor, you had to be applying yourself more. So like, let's say, you know, you see Olympic athletes mm -hmm. and you know they're not hanging out at the 7-Eleven. So <laughs> would you have put yourself into a category that uh, was an overachiever? Definitely, definitely. Um, those of us in uh, medicine or in training often joke that we have kind of type, type A personalities and that we're almost kind of obsessed with the order and the process. And um, the thing though that was important to me was work-life balance and I, I was like that as a young age. I was already very involved in extracurricular activities and volunteer work. I had a good social life and I thought, well, I can have it all. I can also focus in on school and do all of these things and I maintain that throughout my entire training. I think that probably last year was the, the biggest year where I had to kind of really focus but I, I think that it's important for your mental well-being mm -hmm. to have time to yourself to do things but yes. So how many years of formal schooling do you go through before you start coming out and like being a resident? Uh, it is, um, for most medical schools now, it's a four-year um, honors degree, some sort of undergraduate at a university, and uh, if you're lucky and you get in the first try, then mm -hmm. that's all you do. Otherwise, I know people who've gone on to do their master's or physiotherapy. Um, I actually had a fellow classmate who was a nurse practitioner, so um, it, the, the easy answer is four years and then four years of medicine and then residency varies depending on whether you go into family medicine which is a minimum of two years or a specialty which can be five or if you do a fellowship even six or seven before you're able to practice independently. You're looking for family medicine, right? Mm-hmm. And that to me again seems somewhat unusual because what I used to think about is if anyone went into medicine they were looking for money and that they want to specialize in plastic surgery or heart, you know, specialist or whatever. So what got, you, you want to just help people and? It really, totally basic, yeah. My life situation has kind of brought me, um, I think, even closer into this field. The older that I got, I had uh, two grandpas with Alzheimer's disease and I was a primary caregiver for one of them and helped my mom out because we didn't really have anybody else. As well, my mom has three siblings with intellectual disabilities and I'm primary caregiver for the two that are still alive. And so I, I felt like it was just already kind of a natural role for me. Um, sure, money is great, but this isn't the profession you go into to make money because it's a lot of work, um, a lot of hours. You have to really love what you do. It can be a really tough job. and. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of secondary, yeah. especially when you're at the point that I'm at where we have a lot of student debt by the time we come out of the program, so money is just an imaginary concept to me at this oh, point. Do you mind me asking what your debt is? Um, it is close to $200,000. Yeah, you're I know it's, all, it's almost were, embarrassing to say it. Were you it. living at home then when you were studying medicine? Uh, no, I was living in an apartment and trying okay. to share bills with people, but right. I mean, um, Wow. I also had my share of trying to go to Europe and enjoy life before I kind of set into yeah. my career. So, yeah. I mean, that adds up. But tuition, yeah, is expensive. And that's just for family medicine. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was going to specialize and have to go through more years and stuff, they could even tack on. 
Uh, potentially. Once we're in residency, we actually start making um, uh, some sort of income. It's not a full doctor's income, but it's at least kind of uh, something to kind of help pay the bills. And mm -hmm. so if you're a resident for longer, then that's just longer until you make actual doctor's wages. So yeah, I might take residents who do a five-year residency a little bit longer to pay back their bills, but again, hey, they don't do it for the money, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Are you planning to stay in British Columbia or, or are different provinces have different healthcare systems where you could see yourself moving to or? Um, it, it, I mean, they do have different systems. It's definitely been interesting for me to come to BC after I've become so accustomed to uh, how they do things in Ontario and I'm still learning a lot. But I think that regardless of the system, a lot of it comes down to where your family is, your lifestyle, your um, particular interests. So I bought a house in Kelowna. I do plan on staying here. My family lives in Peachland and as well I really like Kelowna in terms of the lifestyle and um, it has a significant uh, geriatric population. I mean, you see lots of elderly around Kelowna and that's um, a, an area in family medicine that I'm really okay. interested in, yeah. You have that all the way up and down the valley. From us. So yeah. we, we one time <laughs> stopped in Summerland and went to a McDonald's and it was just seniors working in McDonald's everywhere you just Same seniors. Way. I think Kelowna has yeah. the youngest population of most of the centers around here. <laughs> yeah, it's fabulous though. It's something that it's, it's my area of interest. That's, That's what I enjoy. So Now I have a question for you. You yeah. studied in Ontario. Mm -hmm. You're doing your residency in BC. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it, um, I'm not sure how to word this, you don't have to write any particular exams to then practice in another province? Is it standard all across the country for uh, medicine? Yeah, I'm still kind of figuring out how the residency exams are going to work. Okay. There was a system that was in place which seemed like it was across Canada and now it's changed over. So we just had an information session on it last week in order to become more familiar with it. But it sounds like whatever exams I do uh, write and then I also have to do practical ones where I pretend to be mm -hmm. the doctor and have a patient, that those will allow me to practice in BC in order to go back to other provinces I'll kind of have to look into it. Oh, but, okay. So uh, it's wanna... totally doable. Like in yeah. fact I was just at a family medicine conference in Toronto and there were some people from southern Australia who were saying Canadian doctors can go do locums there and the paperwork isn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think there's lots of people that help us out if we want to move around a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Now you said you're gonna locate in Kelowna. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that new doctors had to go up north or somewhere when they. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. No, I've heard that. I've also heard people say that. Well, you know, you went to medical school in Thunder Bay. You must have a return of service agreement. You must have to go provide care in that area for mm -hmm. a while, and. Those are decisions that we're allowed to make. It's not really forced upon us. So I have a few classmates who graduated from Thunder Bay and they're from rural Northern Ontario areas and they've signed return of service contracts. So after they're done residency, they are going to work there uh, for a minimum of three years, could be five years, and they get some sort of kind of um, reimbursement for that. Um, our program in particular in Kelowna is a rural program, so of course we are encouraged to go work in smaller communities, and I think that I have an opportunity to do that with locums, so you can travel for a few weeks at a time, go provide essential services to the community. You don't live there, which right. unfortunately doesn't benefit the patients in that area as much as if you were a permanent doctor there, but at least then I can kind of have a bit of both worlds, right? Mm -hmm. So. Now on Sunday night on uh, 60 Minutes, they were talking about HMOs in the United States. Oh. I'm serious. And the doctors there were being pressured in hospitals to admit seniors that didn't need to be admitted because that's how the hospitals earned their living. Mm. And there's a lot of talk that Canadian medicine or the, it, it could healthcare. be facing healthcare, it could be facing privatization. Mm -hmm. Is there any talk of privatization or would, do you think that would be better than what we have or could it open up a Pandora's box? <laughs> That's a really good question. It's uh, something that we hear a bit of buzzing about but I hear about as much as most people do just kind of through the news. Um, it's something they seem to not talk to the residents about as much except when we're kind of having coffee with various physicians and it's kind of just you know in the back room. Um, How do the physicians feel? Uh, everybody has mixed opinions. I believe there is an organization called, I 
Canadian physicians for Medicare. They believe in, you know, keeping it public and non-private. There's, I saw that article in the newspaper here not that long ago about the hospital in West Bank that they want to or open yes, that's private. I personally don't know how I feel yet. Um, I lean towards public just because um, I've been a part of the American health system as a patient and I've seen the difficulties. Um, living in Ontario, it was fairly easy for us to travel to Minnesota for appointments. Mm -hmm. um, I know that our wait times are long and it's it's a big issue in that sense. But Here I, in Canada. Yeah, but I think it would be interesting to see what would happen if we started attaching bills to everything. It would add up. I know that um, uh, our hospital per se would probably like it if we didn't admit as many patients as we do because we're very full, things are often in a gridlock. So the whole HMO thing, I find that to be so... It's just a different world mm -hmm. down there. It's kind of scary when you think about that. Uh, we might be facing changes here because, mm -hmm. because exactly what you're interested in, the seniors, yeah. and that they're talking about, like, you know, that I have diabetes and that we're becoming a burden on the healthcare system, so... I think a lot of it is leaning towards preventative medicine, right? Uh, teaching people about how to keep things managed and kind of how to keep things at bay. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a really interesting concept with the with the HMOs. You also mentioned West Bank. Mm -hmm. And there's people living in West Bank that don't think the Kelowna Hospital should have gone as big as it got instead of have a, region, a small hospital out there because mm -hmm. if someone is has a heart attack, they're going to be transported into Kelowna. Now I've seen that in uh, Princeton, there are people, they've lost their doctor. Mm -hmm. A lot of small communities are losing doctors. Uh, mm -hmm. Enderby recently, they're down to just one physician who's going oh, to be going really? away. And uh, in Saskatchewan, their healthcare organization is going to India to recruit doctors. India graduates 40,000 doctors a year. I didn't know and they're going to be trying to recruit Indian doctors. And so, The international medical graduate thing, I think I've seen kind of an increase in that. They're trying to get some more doctors in a bit faster. Um, I've heard a lot of physicians say, well, if this kind of waxes and wanes like the, the life cycle mm -hmm. with the the deer and the wolves mm -hmm. kind of thing like you get a, a surplus of physicians and then suddenly they cut back the spots in the medical school and then there's a um, there's not enough doctors so then they start to increase the spots again I am too young to notice that or see it mm -hmm. I think that you're right though that unfortunately um, people get drawn to a larger facility or a larger community because of the extracurriculars, the things that are available in the community, the uh, services that are available at the hospital. Um, but on the flip side of that, I think that had our hospital not progressed to get bigger, we wouldn't have these new cardiac services that are here. So that's a big advantage. In fact, I got to be there uh, in the hallway as they were wheeling out the first patient who had a, a cabbage, so the coronary artery bypass graft. So. Oh, wow. Uh, and the excitement over that, I mean, there are, there are some benefits, but maybe my program, the fact that we're a rural residency program, will pump out a, a few more doctors to go to these rural communities. Now, what you were just saying, I, this is going to be a really dumb thing for me to say or ask, but i got to do it. Yeah. When we travel, I get giddy about places we go and see, and you almost sounded giddy about seeing the first patient <laughs> rolled out. It, 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 it was it was just fun because there were so many people that were excited about it. So <laughs> I get like that about some surgeries. I mean, stuff that I would go home and it's completely over my family's head when I say, oh, today we got to do a... Um, a diaphragmatic hernia repair laparoscopically on a patient and it made a world of a difference and they're all sitting there going hmm what <laughs> yeah I, i'm just thinking do you, do you really have to learn all those terms yeah it's a whole new language yeah. they don't that's something that i didn't know going into it was that it'd be like learning a whole new language so when you were going to the school and learning that what would what would your typical day be like um, my program was unique in the sense that we didn't have as much classroom time as a lot of other programs and some of them are kind of gearing more towards like that, especially McMaster, 
I know that our system is similar to theirs. So we do a few group sessions a week. So say Mondays I would have a three hour group session in which we would talk about social or population health and then we break for lunch in the afternoon we do a three hour session about a specific topic like pneumonias. Then the next day I would have three hours in the community where I would be with a physiotherapist learning about what they do uh, and then in the afternoon I would have a lab. And then Wednesday I would have a three hour lecture in the morning and then I'd have another session following up about the pneumonia in the afternoon and then Thursday I would have clinical skills practice where we would pretend to be doctors and watch each other interview and critique each other and then Friday we would have say follow up with lab so that's kind of the way it would work in the first couple of years once you get into your third year you're suddenly a clerk which means that you're doing things mostly in hospital or clinic with a bit of teaching on the side and then suddenly you learn a whole new thing because it's not just um, it's not just the, the history and the physical, the questions you ask, the exams you do. Uh, suddenly you're putting it into practice, but you're also learning how does a hospital work? How do you write a prescription? What's the proper way to actually write a note? And this is... So no one else can read it. <laughs> is there special training for that? <laughs> no, unfortunately there are people like me who are just born with you know, horrible handwriting yeah, skills and there's nothing that, <laughs> This is why EMRs have become a wonderful uh, system in the sense that you can actually read what's typed. You like that, eh? <laughs> yeah, for someone like myself, yep. yeah. <laughs> we, uh, and that's the computerized system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, my GP, he uh, is probably in his 40s or something and he's a real uh, patient doctor, wants to have that contact and conversation uh -huh. and, and he likes the the ease of it, but at the same time, he feels that it, it's taking away that time yeah. that he has. So you're, suddenly you're like, okay, exactly. so what, what was going yeah. on? Yeah, yeah, and we were we all talk about that quite often, kind of how to address it, and I think okay. that maybe with the younger generation, with um, the fact that we've been introduced to computers earlier, and we have, shh, don't tell them I said this, but maybe better typing skills than some of the older physicians that will be able to actually look at the patient while we type. Exactly. Or, and that, and also, I think growing up multitasking. You know, how many of the yeah. doctors have had to, you know, you guys I, grew up doing that. You still don't want to take away from the whole patient experience, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a balance. And when somebody's telling you something really important, you just have to stop whatever you're doing and pay attention because it matters to them. And ultimately, it's going to matter to you. It impacts their health. It impacts the care they right. receive. Um, well, back to getting into med school now. Yeah. What What was your undergrad degree? Uh, I did whatever the guidance counselor told me oh, to do. So okay. they told science me to stars. go into science. Okay. So I have um, an honor specialization in biology, okay. and a lot of my electives ended up being um, psychology courses. Mm -hmm. That's what I was interested in, truly. So. Right. And are, was that a direction then that maybe gave you an edge over somebody that maybe went through the arts program and tried to get into medicine? Um, or is I don't. I don't know if it necessarily did because I actually had a few classmates who um, entered with English majors, okay. arts degrees, and even though I have a bit of the, the background kind of physiology or organic chemistry principles already under my belt, I found that they caught up really quickly and they learned kind of the essentials of all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, multiple years of school kind of tends to make it easier for you to forget things you learned earlier on, right? So if my physiology classes were in the first or second year of undergrad and suddenly I'm entering med school, it's hard to, you know, it doesn't come back as easier as you would think it would. But really? Yeah. If it, it, it's still, a, um, I mean, we often compared kind of which medical school classmates knew what compared to the others because I know the nurses had an easier time with a lot of the procedures. They'd already you know, learned how to do IV starts and draw blood work and... Now at the end of that four year, you said some people weren't able to get into med school right away because they didn't pass the exam. Well, Was so it's it? a huge application process. Okay. Uh, you sell yourself the best you can and you have letters Interview? of reference. Yeah, so uh, first you do the application, you get three letters of reference, they look at your marks, they look at your essays, and then you're invited to interviews. Once you go to the interview, for example, at the medical school I went to, um, there were 300, uh, no, 2,000 applicants, 300 interviewed, 
and then at that time they only took 56 of us and then there was a wait list you're so, kidding yeah well how, how did well congratulations yeah, thanks, but what about the, i mean the other people i i, I no. i'm gonna be blunt i don't think they were dummies no so no, but like is that based on the billing numbers then that are provided for doctors to get be guaranteed jobs when they graduate it's government funding a lot of it okay. from from what i know and my knowledge on this is limited but i do know that it is uh although expensive for us in tuition it's very costly for them in terms of government funding per student oh. so the government budgets depending on yes needs and how many spots they can make available and the resources that are available for the medical students mm -hmm. so yeah and it does it the, it, the interview and the whole screening process is interesting. I am somebody who wasn't accepted my first try. I was on the wait list, and by the time they filled all of the spots, I think I was eight people away from getting in. So I just persevered and applied again the next year and received an interview, and that's when I got in. So you Is it heartbreaking when you don't make it in? Because yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was thinking about. It's oh, all yeah. these poor kids, like they study so and do everything. What do you do if you get that? So sad. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's because uh, because for a lot of us it's our lifelong dream, right? Exactly, so and you got family and and yourself yeah. and. It, it yeah, I was I was um, a bit lost with what to do. Mm -hmm. Through my summers, I worked as a general laborer at our pulp and paper mill in our hometown, so mm -hmm. I chose to stay home with them an additional four months. So that went to about Christmas, and then I went back and and took some extra courses that I thought would benefit me. In, um, in not only in my applications, but to be a physician. So things like um, ethics and other organic chemistry, French as a second language, which I still unfortunately can't speak very well. And uh, yeah, so I kind of um, did what I thought was appropriate at the time, but I do know people who go into a master's or perhaps even another field. Um, I had a friend who considered medical school, now she's a pharmaceutical sales rep, so. It, I mean, in a way, it kind of weeds people out. I suppose, yeah. But nobody was, headed off to Guatemala to some. <laughs> <laughs> some people would would travel. Oh, some people went to medical school in other places. I actually was accepted to four medical schools in the Caribbean, uh, and by chance, I got into the Northern Ontario School of Medicine the day that I had given my deposit to one of the places. Oh no. So although it would have been nice weather-wise, um, it is a bit more difficult to get back into Canada mm -hmm. for residency and I knew I wanted to come back to our country and practice. So. But there are people doing that? Totally. I have a friend who was in Australia who is now a resident in Thunder Bay. So he came back. I've met a few from the Caribbean or from Ireland. So. It's doable. Commonwealth countries come easier, I would guess. So now, I think so. but this is really intriguing that you said there were 2,000 and they took like 56. Mm -hmm. Now, would this happen in other provinces? So does this mean that there's all these kids all across the country that are wanting to be doctors, but there's maybe just a few hundred that make it through? Kind of, yeah. You have to think about to uh, those 2,000 um, students, you would hope that they apply to multiple schools. Yeah. So then, out of that 2,056, get in, and to that's just my campus to, to Thunder Bay. Yeah. And then there's an addition, oh no, sorry, that's both campuses. So then there's five other medical schools in Ontario. So you mm -hmm. hope that some of them went there. Mm -hmm. And yes, some people do apply to different provinces. So you hope some of them go to those. Although, w as a rule of thumb, we generally discover that it's easier to get into the province that we completed our undergraduate degree in. Mm -hmm. So, and then maybe some will get in the next year. Or but, become pharmacists. <laughs> yeah, or do something else. But yeah. I, I, think, I think I almost like that it's so competitive because you, being a physician is a huge responsibility and you want somebody who really wants it and who really cares and who's in it for the right reasons. And if that's the way they have to weed it out, as frustrating as it is, and I'm sure there are people who deserve to be in medical school who never got in, I think that... They, they do need some sort of process, and it's not perfect, but it yeah. seems to be working. Most of my classmates were nice people and mm -hmm. are going to be great, great doctors. Yeah. So Well, that's an excellent answer, too, because like even in sports, there's a gazillion kids trying out, whether it's for hockey or whatever, and mm -hmm. not everyone that makes it to the professionals. Mm -hmm. And you do have to have that extra drive. Yeah. And uh, 
we get a lot of comments on videos like, oh, I'd like to do what you're doing. Well, do you know how much we, time we put into it and stuff? And uh, Everything looks more glamorous until you're actually in yeah. it, right? right? So sure, I'd love to be an actor <laughs> as well. You know, maybe do some modeling. No, but yeah. you know, it's like those things do take a lot of work. Yeah. And, and people say, oh, you're a doctor. That's so glamorous. Well, maybe, unless every second day you're on call for 24 hours and mm -hmm. you haven't gotten any sleep and you forgot that you haven't eaten since yesterday and your biggest priority is that patient who's, you know, not stable and needs to be transferred out. And so how do you deal with that? How do you deal with when, um, when my wife was in intensive care at the KGH, mm -hmm. the nurses even cried. When we were up there, I had kids mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, how how can you deal with that on an ongoing basis? I'm still learning. Um, I'm Do you ever go home I'm, and cry? I'm not afraid to cry. I have cried in front of patients before. If you know someone dies, especially when we've invested so much time and energy, we see the way the impact is on the family, the friends. It's it's tough. You um, try to set your emotions aside as much as you can in order to get the job done. But we do have to take time to reflect on our own feelings because it, it's it's a burden otherwise that you can carry around. So um, they talk to us a lot more now, I think, than they did back in the day about things like physician wellness, the importance of us getting proper sleep. And we have some work restrictions as residents to try and help with that. Um, exercise, I mean... I I have to exercise almost every day that I'm not on call or or else you know I have to, I need some sort of outlet exactly. and um, how many yeah. days a week do you or are you working as a doctor and how many days off do you get? Uh, it very much depends on the rotation. So uh, the one I'm on right now is obstetrics. So I'm I'm doing uh, management of pregnant women, delivering babies, checking on things afterwards. Um, so it is one of the most uh, rigorous work schedules. So uh, the way my call schedule is right now, I am working 24 to 26 hours every second day and then some clinics on top. And it's not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to only work every third day, but that's kind of the way things worked out right now. So um, other times, um, lighter rotations or things with kind of less hours, like the family physician's office, you uh, round on your patients in the morning, maybe at 7 in the morning, you go to the office, say for 9, you work till about 4.35, maybe have an hour of paperwork, you go home. So you do that five days a week and you may get the weekend off. So it really, it it's really does day. depend. Yeah, you kind of just get conditioned I as you go so. through your training, get used to it. Yeah, I suppose. For mm -hmm. relationships, does that mean that doctors get in relationships with doctors because they kind of... I've seen recently that a lot of RCMP are married to other RCMP, so I'm wondering now doctors going to marry doctors. and But even that can not work in a good way if, if you have different... Uh, Schedules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I know because I do see a lot of, of my colleagues who are married to other physicians. My fiancé is an industrial electrician. Uh, for me personally, I enjoy that because I go home. We don't have to talk about work. I have no idea what he's talking about. Is something about pulling wire? He doesn't know what I'm talking about, and I'm like laparoscopic hysterectomy. Yeah. So it kind of works out in that sense. Every once in a while, I would like to go home and be able to kind of unload about certain things that happened without having to explain the basics. But that's why I have really good friends who are in medicine. Other people enjoy being with a doctor because there is that relatability or they met each other in medical school and when you are studying a lot and working a lot you don't have as much of a social life so you kind of stick with the people who know what you're going through and who you spend the most time with. Did you have to hit the books lot? like you said when you were going to classes you'd have all the different things and then be doing books till 2, 3 a.m. in the morning? And... Mm -hmm. I was a night hawk. I studied well into the night. I was definitely sleep deprived. I try and read as much as I could because even though four years seems like a long time to do medical schooling, there's so That's much to know in medicine. Yeah. And you just, you you can't get enough knowledge. You try and do what you can. See, I still read yeah. as that much as I can. That seems a lot changed now. When I was, years ago, going through university, friends of mine that were going through medicine, it was, there was no... Uh, uh, undergraduate degree, mm -hmm. you went into medicine, and it was six years straight of medicine, mm -hmm. which 
sounded like a little bit easier, but who yeah. knows? And they still do that in other countries too. Oh, do they? Yeah, yeah, that's still part of their training program. Yeah. And um, I don't. I it be. I'd be curious to see what kind of difference it mm -hmm. makes. Or, I mean, for me, somebody who knew what I wanted to do right off the hop, it would have been great because exactly. then I could Wouldn't do that. <laughs> as, much, as much as I really liked my plants as a human resource class or <laughs> migratory pattern of birds class, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, <laughs> is a means to an end at times. So do you have, uh, going through now your medical school, was, was there a favorite part of it? A, a part that you didn't like as much? Or... You really have loved it all. Mm, no, there's definitely been highlights. You can't <laughs> like everything about it. I don't think that's possible. Um, uh, I, I still really love general surgery and a lot of surgical procedures, even though I find that I get more benefit out of family medicine and I think my interactions are more meaningful for patients in family medicine but I still love surgical procedures so I remember the first days that I, I actually was the one who sutured up the patient after the surgery or I got to hold some instruments or that one example I was talking about about the diaphragmatic hernia repair so the um, patient was in a car accident had a hole between the space between the abdomen and um, well thoracic cavity we call it but the chest and some of the loops of intestine got caught up there and stuck. So we got to go in with the cameras. Sorry for making you queasy at all. Just see, this is why I love yeah, medicine. Yeah, perfect. But we had to take the bowel out, our intestines, same thing, and then um, close it up with some sutures. And we took some pictures of it, and it was just so cool. And the Put it on Facebook? And I were so excited. <laughs> Due to patient confidentiality, no, we didn't do anything with it. Uh, except kind of show the patient. But, yeah. um, cool. you know, so there's things like that that are awesome. Um, the tragic things, of course, are stuff that you wish you could forget. There are a few patients with sad stories that stick with you and you learn from it and you remember them. And um, I probably shouldn't say what I don't like to do right now just because I'm still in residency. Gotcha. And, but I, I'm, I'm not particularly excited about... Uh, delivering babies. I think it's wonderful and I almost tear up every single time a baby's Aww. born but in terms of where I want to put my skills I think that I um, would give most to patients and I would benefit most working with geriatric population, palliative care. People are very sick, yeah. challenging. Yeah. Wow. One more thing that's I think a big question uh, is like in the RCMP there's a big inequality between female members and male members and in medicine pre previously probably male doctors outnumbered females by great number so now in schools and what you're experiencing in hospitals mm -hmm. is the inequality starting to get better or is there still like in the school 56 students male female mixes we were uh we only had 15 males out of the 56 <laughs> the rest are all female no kidding. Uh, a lot of the medical schools are definitely seeing a shift um female to male either equal or females more it's not always the case but it's definitely becoming more prevalent and i see that a lot of the younger family doctors are female now versus male uh the specialties they're starting to become more females so it's interesting because the older generation is a lot of uh, male, you know, predominance, and mm -hmm. then you're seeing kind of us up and coming females. So why would that be? Um, I wonder if it, I, you know, like, there's lots of kind of theories and thoughts in my head about whether it was not as accessible or not as um, promoted to females. Uh, you know, way back when, um, a lot of women stayed home versus now exactly. uh, more women in the working field it, it's more socially acceptable yeah. uh, I think there might have been some studies that were showing that uh, females m make for really good care providers in terms of being in a physician capacity just because of our uh, whether I, you know nurturing. this is yeah mm -hmm. whether this is a true thing or not but yeah it's something about that nurturing quality so mm -hmm. um, it my theory, really interesting to see, though. my theory would be mm -hmm. that uh, young guys thinking about becoming doctors think of a Mercedes on the golf course, and when they get into medicine, and find it's work and <laughs> studying and all this. Yeah. <laughs> Not all of them. There are probably the ones that are weeded out. Yeah, there's hope. I have a, a lot of. Uh, classmates that were male that had really genuine intentions who were very caring souls and um, it was refreshing to hear people with the same ideas. 
Would you ever consider joining something like Doctors Without Borders? I definitely thought about it and I actually saw a keynote speaker on it once upon a time. Um, I think that it's awesome. I, I try and be very involved in terms of volunteerism, um, being aware of global health and global impact. and. Um, the thing I have noticed though going through my medical training specifically in Northern Ontario is that we have a lot of people who live in almost third world situations in Canada mm -hmm. and I think that uh, I'd like to make an impact that way as well. Uh, when, in my third year I was in a small community, Sioux Lookout, Ontario, and I flew up to different uh, Northern Aboriginal communities that were isolated. A doctor was only there once every month or every six weeks and um, you know there's a lot of poverty and a lot of issues and um, so even though I'm really interested in the Doctors Without Borders I think that I'd like to also make a local impact. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Even in BC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well it, that's something that a lot of people don't realize that there is poverty and there is stuff like what you just said in, in the even in a rich mm -hmm. province like British Columbia. Yeah. Even in Kelowna. Even in mm -hmm. Kelowna. Yeah. I'm Absolutely. definitely noticing yeah. it more since I've moved here. Yeah. Kelowna yeah. now. It's the other day on the news poverty. they were talking about uh, domestic violence. Mm. And do doctors see patients that maybe they can't really ask, you know, like, did you fall down ten times in a row? Mm -hmm. But it, uh, I, what I'm getting at is that, like, the, they're saying that, like, there's thousand plus cases a year that's reported and they figure that at least 10 times as many happen that's not reported. Now as a doctor, what would you be, if you saw something, would you, can you report it or is there a doctor-client confidentiality that prohibits you from? It, it is a bit muddy. Uh, we are taught how to do some screening for things like domestic violence, child abuse, uh, things like that. Um, we are in this profession not to be people's friends per se, but to be the person who asks asks the tough questions so we do try and screen um, it's not always on the forefront and unfortunately sometimes we don't ask um, but if we suspect it at all we try and do whatever we can to kind of get some information you hope that you have enough trust from your patient that you can talk about it with them um, it's different for adult versus a child so if there's suspected issues with the child in terms of neglect or physical or emotional abuse then we are required to report it uh, if it's an adult it's a bit different we can encourage people to seek help um, and uh, I mean there are things that happen if we're worried that somebody's at a harm to themselves or if they're going to harm someone else but um, essentially our, our biggest thing is that we just need to kind of keep on top of it, ask patients about it, be aware that it is an issue. Um, and that's actually a good reminder for me that you said it because now that I'm starting to uh, wrap up my obstetrics rotation and go into a family practice for the next two months, um, I'll definitely have to be cognizant of it. When we were in Mexico this past September, we talked with a physician from San Francisco. Oh, okay. Awesome. He, both him and his wife were in medicine. And his uh, insurance, $100,000 a year, malpractice insurance. Mm -hmm. What's it like in Canada? I'm not sure what it's like as a <laughs> doctor. I think that I purposely try not to find out information too far in advance because I don't want to know. So <laughs> for residents, um, our coverage depends on which province you're in. In BC, I think it's... At least thirteen hundred dollars a year. Well, that's not bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not bad compared to a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and and so it's not as easy here to sue doctors and. Uh, I don't know if it's not as easy or if it's just not as prevalent. Mm -hmm. or, I think it's um, a profession down there, actually, in the states. They, that's what they were yeah. kind of implying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something we kind of think about and try and be aware of, mm -hmm. and that's why we write in charts and yeah. document things. And but. Um, for the most part, I try and just kind of keep that out of my mind. You have to do what you have to do to treat a patient. And you hope that if you've um, made the best decisions that you think uh, any physician in the right mind would make, that you're doing the right thing and mm -hmm. that's okay. And, and There's also an urban myth in the States that if a doctor comes across an accident, he's not going to touch anyone. <laughs> 
-hmm. because if you that. move them or whatever and they don't end up suing you. Mm -hmm. Now, does a doctor have an obligation to help or can they, and in Canada, I guess that wouldn't apply. In Canada, if, if you saw something, you'd do the best that you can and... That's a good question um, because a lot of people do ask that. Uh, so we have kind of our code of ethics that we go by. Um, <coughs> mostly Canada wide and then we all have our own kind of morals and ideals and preferences so um, I mean the technical answer is if we see an accident we're not obligated to stop however if we do stop we should help um, I didn't even think that you could get sued I mean I've had to stop we saw a little boy get hit on a bike by a um, a girl driving a vehicle uh, right before I graduated from medical school we didn't even think twice there was three of us who just finished medical school we stopped we assessed the situation things were okay we kind of moved on thankfully things were okay yeah. but um, yeah because because <laughs> I mean I purposely wouldn't run from an accident I think unfortunately there may be people out there that would um, but it is a tough decision what if you're alone on a highway you see an accident do you pull over and start helping? Is it is it safe for you? Is it safe for the other person? Kind of all things to consider, but... Yeah. My favorite show for many years was House. <laughs> it is a good show. <laughs> Nothing like real, is it? Uh, no. No. Uh, the, the patients in that show are often way more complicated. <laughs> Uh, then we would see kind of in your average run-of-the-mill day, maybe if you're an internal medicine specialist, um, uh, the system never quite works as smoothly as mm -hmm. it does there. Um, there are a few people who are kind of like house, a bit socially awkward, very smart. But, yeah, would you have doctors that are the ones that just try and figure out the tough cases like... Mm -hmm. So that, that is a real... That's their specialty. So what, what, what are they called? Uh, so they would be uh, internal medicine specialists. That's their kind of general internists. Um, and then you have people from that field who branch out into different things. So your cardiologist, your endocrinologist. You I see people with diabetes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you need to tell us. You said, it's not at all real. <laughs> no, because health seems to kind of know a bit about every single yeah, thing. Exactly. But I mean, realistically, you'd have the infectious disease specialist yeah. consulted yeah. and the respirologist consulted. Mm -hmm. It's good, good viewing. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been down thing. to the states and taken a tour of, say, some big hospitals in LA, Philadelphia, or something like, and uh, compare them? Because like Vancouver, some of the hospitals, I guess, like Royal Columbia and stuff like that, are having a lot of maintenance issues and stuff like that. Yeah, They're yeah, there flooding, was some flooding out somewhere. And patients being Sorry. treated in the Tim Hortons. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I have had the uh, luxury of being able to compare facilities. I had a placement at Vancouver General Hospital, so I got to see the kind of the big time operation in Vancouver. But I was also uh, down in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, oh Minnesota. Wow. The Mayo yes. Clinic, marble Everyone's floors, wow. celebrities being treated, you know, multitudes of tests right at your disposal. Yeah. Things happen fast. Um, you have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> it's very costly. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, it's beautiful, but um, they can't always solve everything either. I know a lot of people say, well, if we can't figure it out in the Canadian system, go to Mayo. Mm -hmm. Like, I've heard of lots of people doing that. But as somebody who was a patient at Mayo Clinic, they couldn't figure out what kind of skin condition I had and what was wrong with me. So even the best of the best, mm -hmm. uh, by reputation, can't always can't always get it right yeah. or, or, you know, give you the answer. and. I think part of that is just kind of medicine, but it seemed to run smoothly and Some years ago, mm -hmm. before your time, uh, Americans were up here, uh, I think it's called head, head hunting, or so, just a couple more minutes. Okay. I think they were head hunting, and they, they were uh, recruiting nurses to go to the United States, and a lot of doctors, and are there still a migration? Let's say if somebody's uh, getting up there and a pretty good doctor, does he go, well, geez, you know, I can go down to, to Dallas or LA or Mayo Clinic or whatever, is that still happening or? Uh, it might be, uh, I'm not really aware of it, but I'm sure that with any profession there are people who would want to seek out something that might be a little more, you know, advantageous to them, whether it's money wise or schedule wise or being exposed to the best equipment or That's, the patient yeah. subset, you know, I kind of guess it all depends. Mm -hmm. um, but. 
maybe I'll see more of it kind of once I'm actually a physician and um, get to know more doctors. But so far, none of the residents have been recruited anywhere. But there's I, no I'm recruiters sure coming up happens. here. No, if anything, the recruitment that we receive is from small communities. My hometown, yeah, my hometown, mm -hmm. kind of tried to talk to me about going back. Um, due to various reasons, I've kind of chosen at the time not to, and so they're okay with that, and they kind of leave me be, and I try and toss them a few names of upcoming residents who may be interested in working there, so that's actually where a lot of our recruitment is from, mm -hmm. it's rural communities. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I was saying earlier, yeah. that, uh, People that around BC, most. it's... it's oh, absolutely. And they, I mean, uh, yes, mo money shouldn't be a, a motivator, uh, but they do give incentives to work mm -hmm. in rural communities and that is because you need services there, there are people there, it's difficult to travel, That's right. they have issues too, they need doctors. I yeah. know they desperately need doctors. My, my mom's 85 and lives in a retirement community over in the Kootenays, which is very uh -huh. small. Christina Lake is about 300 yeah. residents. Yeah, it is small. And they have one doctor and it took forever for them to get the doctor there. And, you know, the trail is the nearest location for them over a mountain pass covered with snow. So mm -hmm. dangerous. Yeah, it is. And it's, and it's really tough to keep doctors there as well because it doesn't offer the amenities that you get in a bigger center mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. Lifestyle can be difficult too. Mm -hmm. If you're the only doctor in the community, like even though you want to be off call a few days, um, it's a, it's almost impossible. People know where you live. They know how to get a hold of you. Now, just a quick question, and, right. and you feel this duty, this sense of responsibility for your patients, and yeah. you want to be there for them. And I worked with an obstetrician back in my home community who didn't take a single day off when he was in Fort Francis because. People would just show up at his door saying, "My water broke." Oh no! <laughs> He's like, Get to the hospital. <laughs> so, no um, it, it, uh, he would have to go on vacation. Oh no! So there are challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I would like to thank you for talking with us. Thank I I never suspected me. that doctors were a glamorous field. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> okay, that's I good. always thought that's it was a, a very hard, hard work, work that, that yeah. was beyond what I would want to do and uh, the challenges and yeah. but and the, the emotional. Enjoyment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got enjoyment when my son was born and I saw him for the first time and stuff like that. But totally. uh, it's, uh, it, and it's the heartaches too that you can face. And I faced that at the Kelowna Hospital myself. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. it's. Uh, my, my thinking is always if I can at least do something mm -hmm. to help better somebody's life, even if it's in those last mm -hmm. moments, then I feel I've, I've done my job whether I could help them or not, you know? So uh, it's things like that that keep me motivated when times are tough. Well, I'd just like to say that just spending time with you this afternoon, yeah. that whoever gets you as their doctor is going to be very, very fortunate. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, I mean, you just, you're so kind and personable and very comfortable. Thank you. Yeah, Thank, very you. Much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.